You're busy, you've got a decent practice, but nobody wants to be decent. You want to be great, and you want to have a great practice. So how did the most productive, profitable dentist in the nation balance real life, work, and profits, and somehow make it all seem fun? Well, it comes down to simple, everyday practices. So grab a lunch, join us as we chat with top clinicians and influencers to discover their formula for uncommon success. Are you ready? Then it's time to explore everyday practices with Vicki McManus-Peterson and Dr. Chad Johnson. So Chad, I was sharing with David how excited I am. We have a financial controller here at PDA, and, uh, and so I've gotten to work daily with her for several years and she is very passionate about forensic accounting and I learned from a really young age uh, things that I guess I would never think of you know things I'm I'm amazed at what people think of so I'm very excited to hear how you got into this and your story and be a lot of big listening ears today so oh all right and um, I should just mention one thing by way of preamble Mm -hmm. um what I won't talk about in, in this venue is methodologies. In other words, how, Oh yeah. How people steal and get away with it because. um, No, 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 no. That, that would be giving people ideas. That would be very bad. (laughs) I, 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 I want to empower practice owners. Yes. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to educate uh, the people who want to steal from them at how to get better at the job. No, so I'll would... tell you what, Regan, what you gave was a perfect little uh, pre-intro. And so let me just welcome everyone to Everyday Practices because I think that was a great start. Today we have David Harris, who's CEO of Prosperident, the world's largest firm investigating financial crimes committed against dentists. A self-proclaimed rule breaker in his youth, David changed his direction. And that's what we'll be spending most of our time talking about is the rule breaking. No, okay. I'm just kidding. And <laughs> he spent much of his adult life in uh, the world of investigation and enforcement, where he uses an unrivaled ability to understand the criminal thought process to help educate and protect us dentists. Today, David is a forensic accountant and a licensed private investigator and a CPA. So David, thanks for joining us. Great to be here. Yeah. This is when we just get rolling, but Regan, I'm serious. Yes. I was just like, oh, we can't redo that. Like that's, oh, that's, well, that's it, was, we it, was, it was unbridled enthusiasm and excitement. So yes. I, yeah. I, I like, I mean, I like superheroes. I, I, I equate this to superhero uh, action. So it's just, it's just good. It's good to, it's really exciting. And it's going to give, um, you know, I'm excited to hear from you, David. And, and like I said, your story, but also any piece of information that we can give to dentists that helps them. Um, you know, lifts up dentistry as a whole. So we've had, um, we've had some other guests, one uh, doctor that broke his wrist and couldn't practice dentistry anymore. Uh, And so what do you do when you wake up and you can't practice your profession? And while that doesn't happen to thousands of dentists, I bet it does happen to a lot of dentists and they're out there searching for, for uh, the source of light, you know, help on what that doctor did. So welcome, David. We we end up hiring some of those people. Uh, About a third of our investigators used to be dentists. Really? Um, you know, they have some kind of repetitive motion injury or there's, Mm -hmm. you know, there's something that's made them hang up the handpiece and, and, uh, you know, for, for those few who have the right thought process for us, we, we're, uh, we're, we're a second career for them. Well, we already just learned something right now, Chad. I've got a backup plan. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So David, like, let's fill everyone in on your story. How did you end up in this and, and everything like that? Well, um, if it, it, it all depends how far back we want to go, but I was born um, a poor black child. Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty it's a much movie it. reference um, for those that don't know. Uh, high school, <laughs> high school, and I certainly didn't get along. Oh, and uh, the phone call came at one point from uh, from the principal of my high school to my parents, and basically Ooh. the theme was that it's time for David and the school to stop wasting each other's time. <laughs> Um, yeah. Hit pause for a second there. For all of you that are listening, you can't see our videos, but uh, David Harris looks like a very buttoned up professional. I mean, that, that's right. a, I want, I want everyone to take the judging lens off and see everybody comes from different backgrounds and learns different lessons. Yeah. Well, the, the, the lesson I learned from that was to fall in with the wrong people and uh, quickly got in some legal trouble. And um, I, I, I got offered a choice of green or orange. Orange, of course, is what you wear in prison. Uh, green is the color preferred by the army. Uh-huh. Wow. So green sounded a lot better. 
I, I, I went into the army and for the first time in my life, I kind of felt like I belonged somewhere. And um, the, the, the army rewarded that loyalty. And um, among other things, they gave me my dream job. And my dream job was breaking into military installations as a way of exposing the weaknesses in the security. Yeah. yeah. That was your job? That was my job. Um, very you were much like a the, physical hacker. Yeah. yeah that's Whoa. before you had hackers, you, you had people like me and um, it was, uh, it was a lot of fun. And what I discovered very quickly was how predictable military people were. And that predictability really was what um, made me good at that job. And in, in terms of exposing the weaknesses versus the unpredictability of what let's juxtapose that. Well, what I, what I was, what I was going to say, Chad was um, <laughs> next to military people, the most predictable group I've ever met have DDS or DMD after their name. We are robots. Really? No. In, in, in terms of how they think and how they approach certain problems, pretty easy to anticipate what they're going to do. In the same way that I was successful as a, as a, as a break and enter guy drawing a government paycheck, uh, embezzlers exploit that, that predictability in, in, in the dental profession. Um, and I'll get, let me give you one simple example of what I'm talking about. Let's say that I got fired from my job for embezzling two weeks ago, and now I'm applying at your practice. Of course, I don't want you to call the person who just fired me because if that happens, I won't get the job. So if you're a dentist, all I have to do is pretend like I'm still working there and say to you, please don't contact my current boss because she doesn't know I'm leaving. Mm, right. And, and you know what dentists do? They nod and they say, okay. They say, okay. Right. <laughs> What your audience is going to do tomorrow, Chad, is a little bit different. What they're going to say when somebody presents that story to them is, I understand completely, and I certainly would never want to get you in trouble with your current boss, but I'm going to tell you that we don't hire anybody without speaking with their most recent employer. It's, if you like, though, we can postpone that till the end of the hiring process. Mm -hmm. okay? That's what you're going to do tomorrow. But as I say, and, and, and I, could, I could see you in the, as, as, I was, uh, as I was laying out that scenario, Chad, and you know, oh, 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 what yeah. You would have, what you would have said yesterday. Oh, I'm, I'm an easy sell on that. It's like, oh, sure. No problem. Right, yeah. right. And, but as you say, predictability, if I were to post a, a Facebook um, questionnaire poll of some buddies and stuff like that and say, how many of you in this scenario would, I don't know, I'd guess 90% would probably do the same thing I did. Yeah. Well, I think I think most small businesses because it's a like, small little community that you don't want to stir the turd. Well, and, it, mm -hmm. and it's not just a it's not just any small business, Regan. It's a small business of healers and people. People. I know I know uh, very few dentists who chose dentistry because they had this unquenchable desire to be business owners. No. <laughs> For every dentist I've ever met, um, no way, right? that's that's kind of the unwanted stepchild in the marriage. Absolutely. Yes. That's, I, yeah. Big reason why PDA exists. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, 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 I want to be a physician of the mouth and Oh, by the way, I got to run this business. Surprise. So anyway, I, you know, I, I had some success as a, as, as, as a break and enter guy paid by the government. Um, eventually I left that world and um, got hired by a bank, worked as an investigator there for a few years. And one day I just got frustrated and quit. So I was sitting at home, um, thinking about, well, actually I was trying not to think about what I was going to do next. And the phone rang and it was a guy who'd been in high school with me in my um, short visit there, who was now a dentist. And he said to me, I think my front desk person's stealing and I really don't have anybody else to call. Um, mm -hmm. This was 1989, just to establish the chronology. Mm -hmm. And he caught me at the right time. As I say, I was trying hard not to think about the future. And it was August and there was nothing good on TV. And <laughs> so I said, no problem. I'll meet you tonight at your practice after work and we'll get to the bottom of it. So I went over to the practice. I saw what she was doing and the doctor brought me back the next morning to help him fire this person because he didn't really want to face that job alone. So I did that and I left. Um, I didn't, I mean, I kind of thought this is interesting, but I didn't see a career for myself. He promised to buy me dinner that I'll mention I'm still waiting for. <laughs> from, 80, from 1989? Yes. <laughs> that in an episode of what Magnum I'm P9. calling you out. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've, I've said that on several podcasts and it hasn't really, really come to his attention, but I'll just mention that on one more in case. I want my tacos. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, I, I kind of forgot all about it. And that all changed two weeks later. Two weeks later, I was going into my own dentist's office for an appointment and... 
imagine the jolt I got. I had my hand on the front door. I was looking through the glass in the door and sitting at his front desk was the same woman I helped fired at the other practice two weeks ago. Oh. No way. That isn't exactly what I said as I ran to a payphone. Um, and I, I called my, my dentist and told him what was going on at his front desk. And he hired me on the spot. And that's how I got started. That's a great story on how you got started. No business plan, no financing, no marketing, uh-huh. nothing. A need. Yeah. There was a and, need. And by the time I finished working with my dentist, the local guy from one of the supply companies realized what I was doing and I had two more calls and I was in business. So within the last month, you've uh, published your, your book, Dental Embezzlement. Yeah. My book is, is out there on Amazon. I was going to say it's on Amazon. Okay. Yep. And so uh, fill us in, you know, like who, who should read this book? Well, this? I, I wrote it for practice owners, predominantly practice dentists. Owners. I had to walk the tightrope of finding ways to educate them without simultaneously adding to the toolboxes of thieves. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, there's not a whole lot of here's how you do it information in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but I talk about the behaviors and the, the strategies that dentists should employ to, to combat that. And I will say that the, the, the direction I take people is probably a little bit different than what a lot of people expect. In other words, I think what a lot of people are looking for is policies and procedures and checks and balances they can put in place in their practices. And there is some of that. Sure. But fundamentally, I think those strategies have limits and um, that, that we really need a different approach to truly be successful. It's just such a deep subject, Reagan. It is. Well, and I'm thinking from a, from a business owner type uh, uh, you know, lens on, I can totally see, David, what you're saying. And if, if I'm nodding my head thinking, yes, I want to make sure that I've got this checked off and this checked off, I'm doing this annual check. And you can't, you definitely can't share what people are doing because it gives others ideas to do it. And you almost can't even share what it is that you would be looking out for because anybody listening that would be embezzling would also be understanding that those are triggers that the dentist may be using. Am I right? Um, that's all true. Let's, let's go though to the place where people can be successful. Yes. There's been a lot of research on <laughs> what catches thieves. Mm. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a couple of numbers on, on dental practices. And these are, these are dental specific numbers. The control systems that people put in place on average catch 20% of embezzlement. The other 80% is caught by what I'm broadly going to call dumb ass luck. In other words, some chance occurrence takes place <laughs> and that makes the doctor suddenly realize that, that they have a problem. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example. There was one case I worked on and the way that it came to light was that the thief broke her leg skiing. And Monday morning, for the first time in anyone's memory, she wasn't in the practice. And around noon on Monday, one of the front desk people came in to see the doctor, interrupted him in the middle of a root canal, which was a huge no-no in that practice. Mm-hmm. And said, doctor, I have to talk to you. I've gotten three of these really strange phone calls from people this morning. And, you know, one of them I might kind of shrug my shoulders at, but I've gotten three. And it was people calling to complain about a certain aspect of their bills. And again, three of them in a row. And the light bulb came on in the, in the front desk person's mind. And she, she went to take her doctor out of endo to, to tell him about it. Mm-hmm. That's the kind of stuff that, that happens. You know, a patient will say something to the doctor or as I say, another, another person in the practice will suddenly realize that there's an issue. It's, it's chance occurrence that outs most embezzlers. Well, let me ask a hard question then. Let's say yeah. that we employ awesome protocols and we try and do the best that we can. What's, what's the asymptote perfect number there uh, for, you know, like uh, obviously we can't get to 100% of embezzlement being caught by uh, systems, because some is going to be li- by luck, but what would you say would be an upward number? Can we get from that 20% to 50%? What would be an ideal practices number, like uh, yeah, for prob- statistically over a group of a thousand dentists or something? Um, probably 40 to 50% would be the best you'd ever get. Oh. Um, still a big improvement, but but u- utopia doesn't always exist. Right. The, the problems with controls and procedures and, and, and things like that is that in most cases, we're not talking about stuff the doctor does personally. We're talking about creating rules. Hmm. And if I'm, a, if I'm a thief, one of the first decisions I have to make is, do I follow the rules always or sometimes or never? Um, and, and I'll give you an example. One of the questions doctors ask me a lot about 
is these check scanners in practices. So what, what, what a check scanner does for the, the benefit of those who, who, who don't use these or don't know about them is uh, instead of physically carrying the checks to the bank, you run them through this little machine, which kind of conceptually takes pictures of them and sends those pictures to the bank. And that's the way your checks are deposited. Yep, that's right. So I get asked a lot, you know, will these help me with embezzlement? And my answer is not in the slightest. Because if I'm working in the practice and my plan is to steal your checks, whichever ones I steal, I'm sure as heck not going to run through the check scanner. Right. In other words, doctor, unless you sit there with a pile of checks each day and you you happen to know that these are all the checks that ever could have come in and you run those through the practice personally, run those through the scanner personally, rather, what you have to think of that check scanner as is simply a different way of carrying the, the checks to the bank. You What's know, weird too is when you probably bring up examples like this, it's just such a naive look that you get yeah. from people like, you know, instead of like, oh, tell me, brother, I've had that done. You know, like people go, really? Someone would do that? You know, just as an example. Yeah. At least this Midwest boy. <laughs> you know, like, um, <laughs> Chad, that's how I kicked it off today was typically when I hear stories, I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> You know, you, you, just give, you just give your employees the money and they take it to the bank and it all goes to plan. What? Yeah. Was, yeah what, what, what could ever go wrong? There's something on David's site that Prosperident, is it Prosperident? Yeah, Prosperident.com. That, uh, that, because I'm thinking about tools. If you know, you have to be fairly quiet about the details, there's a hall of shame on your site. And that's something that dentists could do today, right now, as they're listening, right? They could go to this hall of shame. Can you tell us about this hall of shame? Sure. Uh, so it's a part of our website. It's, it's the most visited part of our website after the About Us page, you know, that kind of gives people's bios and things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we, um, you know, we, we, we basically take information that is already in the public domain mm-hmm. and we, we collect it all there. Is this United States, Canada? What countries does this involve? Um, we, we, we work in the United States, Canada, and Australia. So There we go. Those are oh, the, Australian, Australian um, podcast listeners. We actually have quite a few of those. Hey, all right. Um, so so we, we collect information. The frustrating thing about the, the Hall of Shame, Reagan, is that um, we have, I think the last time somebody counted, we have 680 embezzlers profiled there. Um, <laughs> And it's all searchable, so you can enter somebody's name or city or whatever. I mean, you can you can search under under any huh. any parameter you want. Um, the problem is we have thousands more embezzlers who, for various reasons, are not profiled in the Hall of Shame. Sure. So the the incompleteness of it is something that I'm I'm well aware of. Sure. Um, and and the basic rule is simple: we will only deal with cases that are already in the public domain. Mm-hmm. So if we if if we find somebody stealing today and they get fired in their practice tomorrow, it will probably be years before they end up in the hall of shame. Ah, mm-hmm. uh, okay. And um, I know that, and there's just not a lot I can do about it. You know, right. people are entitled to the constitutional presumption of innocence. Uh-huh. Bring your lunch or take us to the gym again next week to improve your everyday practices. Also, subscribe on iTunes, follow us on social media, and sign up for our email list. Now get out there and win with everyday practices. <laughs>